desire and interest in your prayers. We stand before you for a little while this morning. Uh, understand, realize this morning, uh, supposed to be the poem of Elder John Mizell. Um, sometime over the course of the week, uh, a former pastor of his church, uh, a member there, uh, the Lord called him home, and uh, he's there this morning at his home church uh, tending to that situation, that family. So that's why he's not here, and uh, that's why they call me this morning. As just so happened, a few months ago, I asked uh, Elder Bobby Loudermilk if he would come to Cool Springs and preach today. Uh, don't know why, I just felt like asking him to come the third Sunday in August. I uh, didn't have an appointment or anything, just going to have him come and preach and uh, sit and listen for a while. But uh seemed like uh, some providence, a little bit of providence was... It worked there. So uh, uh, hope and trust this morning that some things we'll have to say would be good and beneficial to you. Enjoy the time I was here before last year and uh, been looking forward to coming back and uh, being with the folks here at Mount Olive. Uh, before we get started this morning, I have a couple verses of a song I want to sing to you. Uh, kind of points to what I want to talk about this morning. Once I was clothed in the rags of my sins was wretched and poor lost and lonely within but with wondrous compassion, the King of all kings, in pity and in love, took me under his wing. Oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the King. And His royal blood, it now flows in my veins. Oh, and I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Now I'm a child with a heavenly home, and my precious Father has made me His own. Oh, I'm washed in His blood. Oh, I'm cold in His love. And someday I'll sing with the angels in the Oh, yes, oh, yes. I'm a child of the King and His royal blood. It now flows in my veins. Oh, and I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King, everybody, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Thank you very much. I want to look at a couple of characters this morning uh, in the pages of God's Word. You turn to the New Testament, in the 11th chapter of the Hebrew letter. It starts off, and I want to focus on three different verses, but before we read those, I want to read to you the first verse of this chapter right here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now, the Bible is a very now book. It's a very up-to-date book. It doesn't get out of date. It doesn't get old-fashioned. It doesn't become old-fogy. 
the Bible is very much good for God's children in 2009 as it was uh, uh, way before he ever penned the words down before the writers were ever moved by the Holy Spirit. He says, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. I want, to, uh, I want you to understand this morning before we get started, uh, our subject this morning, uh, you haven't guessed that already, we're going to talk about faith for a little while. It says, uh, uh, by faith we understand that the world's framed by the Word of God. Uh, I want you to know uh, uh, the world would have you to believe today uh, uh, that that's not the case. But I want you to know uh, as a child of grace this morning, uh, uh, we understand, we don't just believe, we don't just know because somebody told us, but the Bible plainly says we understand that the world's framed by the Word of God. And if it's any other way, we just as well shut this thing up and just go home. Sit on the front porch, drink some lemonade, and just let life go by. Because the very first verse of this Bible says what? In the beginning. Who? God created the heavens and the earth. If scientists, if modern theology... If man's thinking, if textbooks, if professors can get you to believe that the very first verse of this Bible is altogether wrong, then the rest of it ain't no good either. It couldn't be. But it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed not by a big explosion, not by bacteria causing some great catastrophe out in the uh, ozone way back a uh, hundred billions of years ago, but the worlds were framed by the Word of God. When He speaks, it stands fast. When He commands, it stands sure. When He works, none can hinder. And God bless Him, when He hinders, none can work. I want to send our thoughts this morning in the same chapter around verses 32 verses th- uh, through verse 34. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse 32 through verse 34 says this, And what shall I more say? The Apostle Paul's been talking about faith, faith of the Old Testament patriarchs, faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who searched for that uh, a living city that God had built up here in the world, uh, who declared plainly that they were pilgrims and strangers here below. But he said, what shall I more say? In other words, time's done run out for me to talk to you about everything else. What shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel. And of the prophets. Now, time failed Paul to tell these brethren of all the Old Testament patriarchs. But we have a little time this morning. So in this time, we're going to look at some of these characters. The next two verses says this. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turn to flight the armies of the aliens. And there's a period there. We're going to focus on that statement this morning in those three verses. Time would fail me to tell you, and then he lists several brethren there, and then he tells all the things that they were able to do by faith. But I want you to understand before we go that route, that Ephesians 2 says, Faith is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's impossible for man to manufacture faith. It's impossible for man to get faith. It's impossible for mom and dad to give you faith. It has to come from God. And when God deals it to you, we can use it. We can work with it. We can strengthen it. Uh, If we choose, we can also choose just to sit around. But these brethren were able to do some many wonderful, miraculous things through faith. And if you allow me to go to the book of Judges this morning, we want to start there. We want to concern ourselves with the characters mentioned here in Hebrews 11.32, Gideon, of Barak, of Jephthah, of Samson, of David also. If you turn to Judges chapter 4, we find an interesting story here about a young brother named Barak. And this was a a brother who the angel of the Lord, God himself, chose to lead an army. But he was a pretty timid old fellow, you might say. 
timid to the point where he had to go ask the prophetess Deborah if it was all right for him to lead an army out to, uh, I believe it was uh, Abinam or, or something like that he was going to lead the army to. Uh, uh, Judges chapter 4, he says, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Now, the whole premise of the book of Judges was this. There was a period of time in the children of Israel's history where they didn't have a king, but the Lord set up judges to rule over Israel. And the the children of Israel would get really close to living to the Lord. They would get really strict about following that law and uh, about raising their families up to to learn the law and know the law. Talking about that old Mosaic law that come down from Mount Sinai over there uh, by way of Moses, you see. uh, And they would get really close like that. uh, uh, Whenever that old judge would die, there was a falling away from that, you see. And if there's a falling away after a man dies, guess who they were following? If... uh, preacher is called home to be with the Lord, and a church starts to dwindle, who were they following to start with, you'd have to question. Well, the children of Israel, they got to follow a man at times in their history, and they began to fall away when the old judge Ehud was dead. And he says here in verse 2, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazar, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron. Twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, the prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And you may think, wait a minute now. This was a, a sister judging Israel. But I thought we wasn't supposed to use anybody but but men. See, I I guess it may have got to the point where all the men were just sorry that God chose a woman to judge Israel. They got to be oppressed for 20 years, it says right here. After 20 years of oppression, they began to cry to the Lord to have mercy on them in that land. Sometimes you might think after being in oppression for just a few days or being down in the dumps for just a few days, uh, you begin to call upon the Lord again. Uh, sometimes it don't take us 20 years uh, to realize that we're in the pit that we're in uh, because of our own doing and it's not the Lord's fault while we're there. But the Lord sent a man in verse 6. She sent and called Barak, the son of Abinahan, out of Kadesh. And said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go draw toward Mount Tabor? Take with thee ten thousand men, the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulon. And I will draw unto thee the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Now there's a promise being made here. The Lord's telling this little brother named Barak that I've called you to lead a mighty army. And if you go and you do, if you're commanded, I'll draw your enemy to you. I'll draw your enemy down to the river where I told you, where I told you to meet him at. But I want you to know that something's going to go on in the rest of this chapter that far surpasses the abilities of Barak and the children of Zebulon's army there of 10,000 men. You see, we read just a few minutes ago that that old uh, captain uh, Jabin uh, uh, of Canaan and his, uh, uh, his captain Sisera had over 900 chariots. They had a very large army and they were going up against a, a rather small force there of uh, uh, Barak's. And the maths just didn't add up. There was no way they were going to win a, a warfare against these people. But I want you to know, if you come down to the 14th verse, they're camping over there by Mount Tabor. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Notice they hadn't fought a battle yet. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. So Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Don't you know that word before is in there for a reason? The Lord destroyed that army before Barak. He didn't use them people to go down there and destroy the army. He destroyed it before they even got down there. 
Which tells me one thing about this particular passage of Scripture. The Lord fought these brethren's battle for them in that day. I want to tell you that's just like the New Testament Scripture where Jesus fights the battle of sin for us. There was a battle fought on Calvary. Make no mistake. In that battle, we didn't have to fight. But there was a warfare waged. And that warfare was Jesus Christ saving His people from their sins. Notice in this particular Scripture that the enemy fled away. What was one of them things that over there in verse 34 that it said that these men did through faith? They subdued their enemies and set at flight the armies of aliens. Take another instance. Go to chapter 6 of the book of Judges there. I want to look at another brother. Judges chapter 6. Look at uh, verse number 1. It says this. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Just like before, the children of Israel had fell away did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And what happened? They were chastised for that because they were delivered for seven years into the hands of many. In other words, they were in captivity in another place just like they were down in Egypt for seven years. And in verse number 11, there's something going to start to happen here. Verse number 11 said, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abitherite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now something's going to happen to begin the salvation of the children of Israel out of the hand of Midian here. And the angel of the Lord is calling this old brother Gideon to go command an army over there and comes to him while he's threshing a wheat on the threshing floor and tells him he's a mighty man of valor and that the Lord has chosen him to do this job. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, he said, If the Lord be with us, why is all this be following us? I want to tell you this day, that's a million dollar question every time somebody gets in distress every time that uh, we lose a loved one, every time financial hardship comes, every time there's a job situation or there's a betrayal in the family, every time there's a fuss in the church, uh, why is this happening to me? That's what Gideon's saying. Why me? Plain and simple. If the Lord is with us, see, he goes tries to put it back on the Lord now. If the Lord is with us, why is this befallen us? You ever heard anybody talk like that? If the Lord's with us, how could this be happening to us? And where be all His miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. See, Gideon wasn't around when the children of Israel come up out of Egypt. This is generations past that. There was nobody around in Gideon's day that saw that. They'd heard about it from their grandfathers, who'd heard about it from their fathers, who'd heard about it from their fathers. And they're in a mess over here in oppression by the hand of the Midianites here uh, by a foreign country. And Gideon's saying, why is all this happening to us? If God loves us so much, why is He allowing this to happen? And where's all of His miracles at? Uh, We know and we understand that He led our fathers up out of the land of Egypt uh, and sent ten plagues upon the Pharaoh and led them across the Red Sea on dry ground uh, and uh, uh, led them unto the land of Canaan after 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, uh, We believe in a God like that, uh, but where is He now? You ever get feeling like Gideon? Like you're in, under oppression from the hand of these Midianites. See, what, what the Midianites represented is this carnal world out here that has the Lord's people oppressed from time to time, gets them down in the dumps. You know, Satan has all kinds of devices. Satan works in all sorts of different ways. One of the best ways he works in one of his oldest tricks is to get you to believe that God just don't care anymore. God just don't care. He used to care. He used to love you, but He's turned His back on you. He's forsaken you already. 
That's what happened to Gideon. That's what happened to the folks in his day. They got to thinking that the Lord had forsook them. Have you ever got to thinking like that? You ever got to thinking that God had forsook you? God had forsook your family? Maybe God had forsook your church? Maybe there used to be something there, but it just doesn't feel like it used to anymore. That was Gideon's position. The Lord used to bless us with all these wonderful blessings and miracles, but where's all of that now when we're in trouble? It seems like every time we get in trouble, He's done gone. I want to tell you, when we're in trouble in this world, that's the time we need Him the most. That's also the time we don't look for Him, really. If you remember in the New Testament, believe it's Mark chapter 4. They were out fishing one night, crossing the Sea of Galilee. And notice what Jesus said before they got into the boat. He said, let us go, pass over unto the other side. But you know what happened when they got in the middle of that sea? It said the winds became boisterous and the waves became contrary. And the, the water started filling the ship up. And those disciples, you could just see them just pailing that water out of there, uh, arm load by arm load. And when it finally got to where they couldn't do any more, when it finally got to where they couldn't help themselves, when it finally got to the point where they knew that they were going to sink if something didn't happen quick, they went and said, uh, uh, we remember Jesus is asleep in the hinder part of the ship. And they went and woke him up and said, Master, care us out, not that we perish. That's exactly what Gideon was doing. Lord, don't you care? He arose and said, O ye of little faith. And he looked out over the winds and the waves and he said, Peace be still. And I want you to know there was a calm over that sea of Galilee, the likes of which had never been seen since. The winds and the waves stopped. And the disciples murmured amongst themselves, saying, What manner of man is this? But even the winds and the seas obey him. Gideon was doing the same thing. They thought in their time of distress that God had forgotten all about them. Those old disciples thought they were going to sink and that the Lord had forgotten all about them, that the Lord just didn't care if they perished or not. But I won't tell you, when you're with Jesus, you're in good hands. You know, they say you're in good hands with all state. You have a couple accidents, they'll cancel you out. But with Jesus, you're in good hands. Gideon said here uh, to, the, to, to the angel of the Lord, he said, We're be the Lord and we're be all of His miracles now. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Does that sound familiar? That was the same situation David was in. He was the least of his father's children, the very least of his father's house. Uh, he was just a shepherd boy over there on the hill. Uh, uh, when somebody told old Jesse that uh, uh, one of your children are going to be anointed king of Israel, he took all six of those brothers in there before the king, and they didn't find none good. He left David at home because he knew it couldn't have been him. He just a little runt. He said, is this all your children? He said, no, we, i got another one. He's just a, he, he's just a shepherd. Well, I'm glad we serve a good shepherd today. David was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Gideon was too. He was the very least of his father's house. And what did he say? My family is poor in Manasseh. But I I, I love to sing the song, Poor and afflicted, Lord of thine. Among the great unfit to shine. For though the world may think it strange... They would not with the world exchange. Because we have a treasure in Zion far above what carnality could give. We have a treasure in Zion that laid up for us in the church that God has built here in the world that is so much more rich and so much more joyful than what the material things of the world could ever bring. And I want you to know what Gideon did there from that point forward. Gideon went on and commanded an army of 33,000 men. And God told him over there, he said, you've got too many men with you. And Gideon said, Lord, no, we don't. The Midianites are 132,000 strong. They outnumber us by 99,000 to start with. The Lord said, you've got too many with you. I want you to, I'll tell you what I want you to do, Gideon. 
He said, I want you to ask him a question. I want you to tell him if you'd rather go home, if you'd rather just go back, if you don't want to fight, go ahead. And don't you know, 20,000 of those men turned and went home. Gideon was marching into battle with 10,000 men against 132,000 Midianites. The math just don't add up. But I want you to know something else happened there that day. The Lord told Gideon, you still got too many. Wait a minute now. Hey, hey, this, this is getting deep right here uh, because we, we've only got 10,000. We're out number 13 to 1. You still got too many. He said, take them down by the water and I want you to watch them drink. The ones that lap the water up like a dog, I want you to keep them and send the rest home. And did you know Gideon only got to keep about 300 men? 300 men going into battle against an army of 132,000 Midianites. It's just uh, mathematically impossible that they would win. But you know, the world's always had a problem with their mathematics. They don't figure God into the equation. It never was God's plan for them to meet on a battlefield. So I want to tell you what. Satan's strong in this world, but God's stronger. In all things, he has the preeminence. You know, the Armenian would tell you God has all power in heaven, but the devil's stronger down here. That's not so. The children of Midian were encamped in a camp in a valley one evening. And the Lord told Gideon over there, he said, what I want you to do is I want you to mount up on your horses. I want you to go around. I want you to put a light on your lantern. And I want you to go surround that valley on, on horseback. And I want everybody to take a trumpet over there with them. And when you get, uh, when you get good and ready, I want somebody to give the signal. And you're going to uh, turn the lights out and you're going to blow the trumpet. And I want you to know what's going to happen. Those children of Midian began to slay one another. Did you know they didn't have to go down there? Confusion set in. And the enemy destroyed itself. God fought the battle. They didn't have to. Gave them a victory they didn't even deserve. A lot of times in this life, if you'll just wait long enough, the enemy will destroy itself. The enemy will self-destruct. What happens to murderers? What happens to liars? What happens to womanizers at the end of the road? They all end in ruin. They all go downhill. If you just wait long enough, the enemy will expose itself and will generally self-destruct. God's people are to seek the good path. The old path, where is the good way? And walk therein. If you go a couple more chapters later, I want to go to Judges chapter 11. And we'll only be here for just a moment of time uh, uh, here. And if the Lord don't uh, bless us with something here, we'll go ahead and uh, get out of the way. But I, I believe we'll see something here uh, in, in this brother here in, in Judges chapter 11. He says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor. He was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. Gide uh, uh, Jephthah was just like Gideon. He was a mighty man of valor, the book says. But I want you to know that he was begat of a harlot. Do you know who Jephthah represents? I believe Jephthah represents the Gentiles. He was born of an harlot. We'll read on here. Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his, sons, his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit our, in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Did you know that Jephthah's own brethren didn't like him and kicked him out of the house because they didn't want him to inherit anything his father had? That's just like old Joseph, wasn't it? They kicked Joseph out one time because they thought his father favored him, gave him a coat of many colors. Jephthah was out over here. And Jephthah fled from his brethren to dwell in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. Why in the world would they thrust this brother out in a time where they didn't want him to take part in their father's inheritance? But I want you to know... Tough. They went and tried to fetch him back. They wanted him to come back and help. You ever know anybody like that? While things are going good, I want all the glory. When things are going bad, when things get a little tough, when you need to start putting the extra hours in, they all of a sudden want you to come back and help because you're their good old friend. Nobody knows anybody at work like that, I'm sure. 
that just wants all the glory when the going is good? Well, they said to Jeff, they come and be our captain, that we may fight the children of Ammon. And Jeff say, uh, said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? He just couldn't resist the fun there, you see. They come back to him and tried to beg him, like, Come and help us now. We're in a war. Uh, your own brethren, your own family's in a war against the children of Ammon. But he said, uh, Didn't you hate me? Didn't, weren't you the very ones that expelled me out of that land? Why now you want me to come back? They were begging him. They were begging him. I don't want to tell you just exactly how that story went down. We won't read the rest of that chapter, but I want to tell you how that kind of went there. Jeff Day, you see, was an old brother that uh, got turned out by his family. And I, I know that some old Baptist folks across the country have experienced that from time to time. Uh, when uh, the Bible says to, to, to forsake father and mother, uh, I want to tell you that uh, what it means is uh, that you to leave them over there in that land and uh, come into this land just the same way that Ruth followed Naomi into the land of her God and the land of her people uh, and left her father and her mother in that strange land with those strange gods. Little G, do you see? Uh, there's something to be said about this land. Uh, it's the good land, a land that flows with milk and honey, that God's people ought not to be ashamed of the call home today. And Jeff, they come back over there, and he said, I'll tell you what, have you let me come back to this land? He said, I'll lead your army. And they said, Jeff, they, they said, we'll, we'll, we'll go you one better than that. They said, if you'll come back and you'll lead our army, we'll make you the king over all this country. And he said, well, that's a mighty proclamation there. But Jeff, they said, before I come back, the Lord's got to be the one uh, that delivers the battle into my hand. Uh, because if he doesn't deliver, uh, uh, then we'll surely fail. Uh, that sounds like uh, uh, the Armenian tried uh, to work his way to heaven there, don't it? Uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, he said, uh, uh, the, the, the folks said unto him, if you'll just come back and command our army, Jeph, they, uh, uh, we'll let you be the king over all this land. Uh, and Jeph, they eventually made a vow unto the Lord. And he said, uh, uh, when we go down into battle tomorrow, uh, if you will, uh, uh, give the victory into my hand. Uh, uh, then whatsoever I see uh, coming out of my door when I return home, uh, I, I give it as a burnt offering unto thee. I want you to know what happened. Uh, uh, he went down that battle. Uh, uh, was fought uh, in one verse. It says here, uh, uh, so Jeff, they passed over under the children of Ammon to fight against him. And the Lord delivered them into his hand. Uh, I want to tell you, we have a strong deliverer today in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, you know, if you order something in this world, uh, it'll come in a fast food down the road. Uh, uh, they may bring you the wrong thing. It may be a little late. Uh, they may not be able to find your house. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ delivers. Uh, and when He delivers, it's delivered good. Uh, and it's delivered right. Uh, and He delivered uh, those children there that day uh, into the hand of Jeff Fay and his army. Uh, and when they were delivered there that day, uh, uh, Jeff Fay went home. Uh, and but when he went home, uh, he went home as a, a hero. He went home as a leader, as a conqueror. Uh, and they were just cheering. Uh, uh, he's a jolly good fellow and all that. But I want you to know uh, that he remembered remember the vow that he made unto the Lord and his vow was whatsoever I see coming out of my door when I return home I'll give it to you as a burnt offering and when he returned home don't you know uh, they brought him to his door the hero's welcome the first thing that come out of his door when he got home was his daughter oh Lord he remembered the vow that he paid oh Lord I don't know I don't know if I can do this Give a burnt offering, my daughter, my, my only, he was his only child. And she was a virgin woman. You know what that daughter represented? It represented the Savior for sin. It was a virgin sacrifice. Do you see, Jeff, they explained to his daughter, he said, I made this vow unto the Lord. Uh, honey, I don't want uh, to do away with you. It's, uh, it's going to break my heart. And she said, oh, no, Daddy, no, Daddy, you made a vow to the Lord. And you're going to keep it. You know how that daughter represented Jesus? She was a willing sacrifice. She went willingly to the burnt offering that day. She said, I want to tell you, Daddy, she said, if you'll just give me two months to bewail my virginity. Oh, that virginity, hey, why it represents the church, represents the bride of Christ. Did you know that there's no spot and there's no blemish with the bride of Christ? 
Did you know that there's nothing to be blamed for? Did you know that when we stand before the Lord at the latter day, when He comes back to gather His children up uh, once again for the final time, uh, and the old angel Gabriel sets one foot on land and one foot on sea and declares time to be no more, and Jesus Christ comes back and splits the eastern skies wide open. Uh, he says, come home, my children, come home. I want you to know when we get up out of that ground that we're not going to stand at the end of a big long line uh, to be judged for all our sins and shortcomings. Uh, uh, because when the Lord looks upon on His children. He doesn't see us for what we really are. He doesn't see us for what we see when we look in the mirror. He doesn't see a wretched sinner. He doesn't see somebody that used to walk in a path of unrighteousness. But what He sees is a child that's made white in the blood of the Lamb. What He sees is a child that's perfect and fit for heaven and immortal glory because of the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary's cross. And I want to tell you just about that sacrifice that He made there on Calvary for just a few minutes of time this morning. I said there, I Isaiah chapter 7. He said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth the Son, and she shall call His name Emmanuel. I'm going to tell you, it happened just that way. If it happened any other way, heaven, they were all together lost and undone because I believe everything that Jesus accomplished on Calvary hinges upon His divinity as being the Son of God. But the world would have you to believe today. The world wants to write books. The world wants to make movies about how Jesus Christ is not the Son of the living God. They want to huff and deep and make a few dollars off God's people. And folks buy into that, brethren. But I want to tell you today, you don't be buying in such a, a foolishness such as that uh, because the Bible says uh, in the Old Testament prophecy uh, that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. I want to tell you, uh, nowadays these women have children all the time in this world, uh, but there's only been one time that a virgin is conceived. And that's when the mother Mary uh, had uh, uh, within her the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, and uh, brought forth a son and called his name Jesus. Uh, for he shall save his people from their sins. Uh, uh, there when the angel uh, uh, spoke to Joseph in that night dream, uh, and he said, Fear not to take of thee, marry thy wife. Uh, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, Jesus was literally the Son of God. It's not just a good story. It's not just a wise tale. It's not just a myth. Uh, it's a fact of the matter that Jesus Christ is of uh, who he said he was. And that's the glorious and victorious Son of God today. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, he says this language. He said, uh, For who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground this morning. I'll tell you just exactly what that means today. He said, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I'll tell you what that means here. He's asking a question Who's Jesus Christ revealed to today? I believe he's revealed to his children, don't you? I believe he's revealed to the ones of whom he loves, who have believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. If you'll go out of the 66th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah now, and you'll go and you look a few verses down there, and he begins to use language like this. I've tried the wine press alone. He said, I looked and there was none to help. I wondered if there was none to uphold. Therefore, by my own arm, I brought salvation unto my people. Who brought salvation to God's people? Jesus Christ. By my own arm. Jesus Christ is the arm of the Lord that's talked about there. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. I will tell you, that tender plant was Jesus Christ coming up in his infancy and in his childhood. As a tender plant, it's not hindered by the bugs, it's not hindered by disease, it's not hindered by drought, not hindered by floods or famine. It's a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, that this morning represents the dry ground is the virgin womb of Mary. The root out of dry ground is Jesus. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see Him, there's no beauty that we should desire Him. Could you see a man like that? Could you see Him come walk in the shores of time? Could you see Him come not as the stained glass windows picture Him as just a, a beautiful white man with these uh, a dark flowing locks and this a trim beard and things of that nature, this long, beautiful white cloak wearing around. I want to tell you, that wasn't the picture of our Jesus uh, as His Bible describes. Uh, the picture of our Jesus is a man who came meek and lowly and humbled Himself unto men, who knelt and washed His disciples' feet there in that upper room one, on one occasion. He was a humble man. He was a poor man. He wasn't rich in the things of the world. But oh, he had a treasure far beyond anything this world could tell. 
for he was the Son of God. Yo, know, Jeff, they, he went ahead. He went ahead and gave that little girl as a burnt offering, that little virgin girl. And it said, unto the day this scripture was written, that the daughters of Israel went once a year to her grave to mourn. I want to tell you, there's so much in this Old Testament that we can get. No wonder Paul said, time would fail me to tell you of all of these brethren. Of Gideon, of Jephthah, of Barak, of David. Well, what did David do? Well, he was anointed king of Israel, yeah, but I want you to know that there was an army that come against Israel one day. The Philistines. And there were giants over there in that land. And there was giants come down to that battlefield. And old Israel was over there. They were just shaking in their boots. They were wondering who was going to go out there and face this mighty Goliath. And I want you to know that there was one little brother. He come over there that day and his older brethren were there and they said, David, you're too little to be down here on the battlefield. You ought to go back home and tend over the sheep. And he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I may be small. I may be little. But I can offer something. And they said, well, here, you put this armor on. You put on all of Saul's armor. And you go out there and face that old Goliath. I want you to know he put that armor on. He took one look at that battlefield and he shed it right back off. He took Saul's armor off. You know why he took Saul's armor off? It hadn't been tested. It hadn't been tried. If David would have went into battle with Saul's armor, he would have lost. But he went there that day with his loins girt about with the word of truth. His feet shed with the preparations of the gospel. He went with the helmet of salvation. He went with a breastplate of righteousness. And he went out there with the sword of the Spirit. I want you to know he picked up five smooth stones. And old Goliath standing across the field with that sword. It had to be bigger than David was. And David stood back with that one little stone and slung it in that sling. And I want you to know what the Bible says about that man. It said it hit him right between the eyes. And the giant loaded his leg. And David went over there. And you know what he did to that giant? He cut his head off. Matthew, what granddaddy say? How do you kill a snake? You've got to cut its head off. That's exactly what he did to that giant. The Lord is with him in battle. The Lord blessed him there that day. That scripture also mentions Samson, I believe. I want to tell you just about Samson for a minute in Judges chapter 14. Samson was on his way to find a wife. He was on his way into a neighboring village, and his parents didn't like it none. It would be like it would be like one of our children trying to marry. Somebody over here from another order and them going to try to stray them off over there. Try to sell them on that works or try to sell them on that Calvinism or try to sell them on that universalism or something like that. Samson took a woman of a strange country, but his parents knew not that it was of the Lord. And the Bible says that while he was on his way down there to that strange country, to take that woman to be his bride, there come against him a great line in Judges chapter 14. I believe it's uh, in verse number 5 here. We can get that. He said, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Samson was on his way to do what God had told him to do. Samson was following in obedience unto the Lord. And there come a lion roaring against him that day. But I want to tell you, children, and this, uh, I want to tell you just exactly how the New Testament is just a, a book that's just as good for now as it ever was. Uh, have you ever been following the Lord? Uh, have you ever been doing what you ought to have been doing? Uh, have you ever been obedient unto the Lord and there comes something against you? Satan's come against you. A snare's been in your way. Uh, something's happened uh, uh, where it seemed like you shouldn't be doing that anymore. Something's happened to try to hinder your service to the Lord. It happens all the time. There's a woman at our home church. Her children go to another order of church and they want her to come over there with them. But she don't believe that way. But they said, well, you're our mama, though. Well, what's that got to do with anything? The truth is the truth, whether I'm your mama or not. That's what she told them. She's pretty, she's pretty plain spoken. Samson killed that lion with his bare hands. While he killed that lion with his bare hands, they continued down into Timnath. They got the bride. 
And on the way back home, a couple of verses later, it says here in verse 8, And after a time he returned to take her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating. There was honey in the carcass of that lion on their way home. How in the world can that happen? Honey only comes from two places. First one's obvious. Bees can make it. Bees didn't make that honey. Do you know what bees have to do to make honey? They got to work, don't they? These bees were swarming. They were mad. They weren't doing no work. That honey come from the same place it come from in Deuteronomy chapter 32 where it says he blessed Jacob to eat honey out of the rock. It comes from the rock and bees make it. But I like the kind we got better. That land that flowed with milk and honey that's called Canaan comes directly from God out of heaven. Samson was blessed to slay lions. All of these things mentioned in verse 33 and 34 of Hebrews chapter 11, these brethren were blessed to do. So many things. By faith, they were able to accomplish all of these many wonderful things with the help of the Lord. You know, when Paul was sitting in a Roman prison in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, he was sitting in prison one night. You know what he was in prison for? The Apostle Paul was in prison because he'd been preaching the grand and glorious gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was in prison for doing just exactly what he used to put people in prison for doing. He was in prison for following the Lord in obedience. And I want to tell you, he was in prison there that day. He was in a cell, solitary confinement. But I want to tell you today that there's a friend that's still closer than a brother, ain't there? In the darkest hour of your life, in the darkest time of your life, when you seem to be all alone here in the world, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Paul was the, uh, absolutely by himself in that jail cell. But I want you to know that in the strange vision in the night, Jesus Christ come to him. He said, Paul, as you preached of me at Jerusalem, you must also preach at Rome. Well, Lord, how am I going to get there? I'm in prison down here. Oh, I want you to know that God opens doors, that God makes ways. God opened a door for Paul. And you know, they were transporting the prisoners one day. And old Paul got on a ship there in the next chapter. And it said they got on that ship and the storm come against that ship. And once you know that ship began to fall apart. All the crew began to do everything they could trying to piece it back together, trying to bail that water out of there. But I want you to know what Paul said to them there that day. Except you abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Oh, that ship. That ship's the grand old church kingdom. I, it, it, the world tries to put it down an awful lot. But except you abide in it, you cannot be saved. That's a salvation in a timely sense. Not talking about heaven and immortal glory. That's talking about the here and now. That's talking about being saved from drowning in that water out there is what it was talking about. And I want to tell you, when we get away from the fellowship of God's people, when we get away from the service of the Master... When we get away from loving our brethren as we ought to do, you know, there was a new commandment given in the New Testament by Jesus Christ Himself that you love one another. When we get away from doing stuff like that, we start drowning in that despair. And I want to tell you just exactly who it takes to help you. There was another ship one night that they were out fishing on. The disciples were out fishing late one night, and I want you to know that uh, there come a storm, and all the disciples began to be fearful. You know why they were fearful? Because they weren't trusted in Jesus. Oh, when we trust in Him, all our fears are gone. When we trust in Him, when we begin to lean on Him, we're not afraid of death, are we? We're not afraid of all the devils and demons of hell because there's none of them that can tell us we're not a child of grace when we get lifted on that mountaintop, is there? Oh, no, there's not, 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 not in this world today, but the disciples were out on that ship one night. And I want you to know what happened to that old brother Peter. Uh, they started looking out across the wind and the waves and they saw a vision. They saw an image appear out there. They thought, well, oh, Lord, oh Lord God Almighty, uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, and they thought it may be a ghost or something. Uh, they thought it might have been a spirit out there on that water. Uh, but I won't tell you just exactly who it was. Uh, it was Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and He calmed their fears when He said, uh, uh, Fear not, for it is high. And old Peter began uh, uh, to say unto Him, You know, Peter was a little bit of uh, a country, if you will. Uh, uh, Peter was uh, uh, one that wasn't 
totally converted until later in life. Uh, uh, Peter was one. Uh, and then when the Lord God Himself said, uh, uh, Fear not, it is I. Oh, Peter began to say, oh, Lord, uh, if it be thou, bid me come. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, when God speaks, uh, His children listen uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, don't ever doubt uh, what the Lord has to tell you. Uh, he said, Fear not, it is I. Uh, Peter said, That's not good enough. Uh, if it's you, I want you to prove it. Uh, if it's you, I want you to bid me to come. And oh, Peter began to say unto him there, uh, uh, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, uh, He said unto Peter, He said one little word, He said, Come. He didn't tell him enough. He didn't preach the sermon uh, about an everlasting life. Uh, he didn't preach the sermon about a living to atonement uh, or irresistible grace. Uh, all He did was say one little word. Uh, he said, Come. And oh, don't you know uh, uh, what Peter did there that day uh, uh, when he got down by that ship? Uh, uh, my dear brother, uh, uh, Peter went up to that directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, don't you know what happened? Uh, he got a walk. Upon there, he got to looking around, and he got to facing the things around, 